the battle of Britain is about to begin. Welcome back to the Leaf and Suit Podcast. Tonight, we're a team member short, as the Heat has made a casualty out of Casey. Well, or more properly, a casualty out of his air conditioner. But we are joined by the man who hails from the great state where both pants and air conditioning are optional. Pennsylvania's own Steve Toth. Steve, how you doing? I'm good, man. Right now, I'm AC on, pants off, so we're good to go. <laughs> That's more than I needed to know. <laughs> Uh, also on the show tonight, we have our friend whose Florida man beard fears neither heat nor humidity, our own Brett Cantor. Brett, how you doing? Good. It's all in the conditioner. Good. And, and hopefully you are wearing pants or at least something on your lower half. Not that I can see on the video and I don't want to. But anyway, so we got a lot to talk about tonight. A lot has gone on. I had a real short episode queued up so we could talk about Wing Commander. And that will be one of our topics. But... We're going to talk about a lot of things that are going on. Before we get to that craziness, though, uh, we got to talk about the schedule because this episode, if we proof it soon enough uh, and proof it faster than Warlord does in more detail. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I say that out loud? Uh, we will have this out before the first event, Twisted Lords in Oklahoma City, July 14th through the 16th, where it'll be uh, at least Steve and I, and depending on if Casey gets his AC fixed, Casey there. Uh, and we will be playing Blood Red Skies, maybe some Aeronautica, who knows what else, generally hanging out and causing trouble. Uh, then we will have Historicon. Uh, Steve, you're going to be at Historicon with all the stinky Northeast gamers. Yeah, I'll be there for at least the Friday for sure. So uh, I'll be wearing a Lead Pursuit shirt. I will have my pants on, so stop on and uh, you know say hi. Look and... for the creeper wearing pants and a lead pursuit shirt. That's probably Steve, or it might be one of our lead pursuit faithful. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, that'll be good. Uh, and hopefully, I think you said the guys uh, doing missile threat are going to try to come up. Uh, yeah, there will be a, a contingent of uh, like a Maryland crew that does some all kinds of different historical games. Uh, so yeah, look for them. Maybe a little black powder, red earth. Maybe a little missile threat. I don't think they're running. Bunch anything. of operators, right? Yeah, operators, cool guys. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> wear your multi. Wear your multi cam black and join the fun. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice. That'll be good. Uh, looking forward to that. Sorry, I won't make it up there, but yeah, two two events back to back. I don't think uh, I could do that. Uh, then we have NashCon uh, with some question marks by it. So August eighteenth through the twentieth. I don't know if I'll be there. I think uh, I've got a work trip that's going to now about right up against it. Um, and while I love all you guys, I'm not going to come home, kiss my wife, and immediately get in the car and drive to Nashville to be around stinky gamers. Not that much. Um, but uh, some other people might be there. John might be there. Some of his raiders might be there. So uh, definitely go to NashCon, have a good time, play some games, and we will probably catch up with everyone later for that one. And then Siege of Vicksburg, October 20th, 21st. Uh, the Steve Toth Memorial uh, Blood Red Skies Tournament, definitely going to go on there. So I know we have a few players that are excited about that. Uh, and uh, maybe Steve and I will get to play in that one. Who knows? Can you play in your own Memorial Tournament? I guess you could because it's I got your know, name That'd on be kind of weird, so, though, so you right? you can kind of break the rule, But you can kind of break the rules. I mean, it's named for you. All right. Well, cool. Any other events anyone's thinking about? I know we've talked a little bit about uh, Millennium Con and its one-day event. Uh, any other things? We're not going to Crucible. No, we're not jinxing ourselves again. <laughs> Brett, you can go to Crucible. <laughs> you can drive down. <laughs> See if the hurricanes follow you. Um, but I don't think we have any other events set until next year. So a little bit of break at the end. All right. Let's talk about all the other craziness going on. Uh, I did want to address pre-orders real quick. We have seen... Pre-orders drop for the B-26Bs, HE-111s, and Wing Commander. Uh, if you ordered it from Lead Pursuit, they should have shipped out to you. Um, and there's obviously some issues, and we'll cover some of those tonight. I guess the B-26 cards look like they were cut to the wrong size. Some of the HE-111s don't uh, 
the wings don't fit right. Hey, as we always say, if you got a problem with it, please contact info at warlordgames.com. Go to their customer service people and say, hey, what can you do? Um, and if it's not a big deal, like the card's just the wrong size, then, well, we'll survive. Um, the jet pre-orders are supposed to be July. I think Italians are also supposed to drop this month. We'll see. We'll see what all drops um, and what starts getting shipped out. But uh, I expect that at least the jets will come out this month. Maybe they will have to roll uh, Italians to August, but who knows? Warlord knows their schedule better than us. And speaking of Warlord's schedule, who wants to talk about the acquisition? What did anyone think of that? So, so for those before we, I guess before we chat about it, those who don't know that live in a vacuum or under a bubble or under a rock or in their mom's basement playing Warhammer, uh, Hornby, a British train company, we'll call it a train model train company. Uh, Steve's favorite people out there, I must say. He he loves model train people almost as much as he loves war gamers. Uh, but a model train company that has a variety of other holdings. Uh, has now acquired 25% of Warlord Games uh, with an option to buy 26% in two years. And that's kind of the part we're going to weigh in on. Um, so, Brett, Steve, what are you guys thinking about the acquisition in the near term? Uh, what do you think the impact's going to be? I mean, I would guess it's like a, I mean, I don't know anything about this other than what I've read, but it sounds like possible infusion of cash for the company, which is probably a positive thing. Maybe a chance for the current owners to have an exit plan for retirement. I, I'm just presuming a bunch there. Doesn't Hornby own Airfix? Is there some they legacy do. to like so, our genre? Yeah, they they own two interesting companies. Um, I mean, they literally own a ton of train companies. And it's kind of funny, all the different model train companies around the world they've acquired and competed with over the years. Um, so they're kind of the, the, the big man on campus other than, and I'm forgetting the German one right now, um, but uh, but they've kind of acquired all the other parts. Uh, but yes, Airfix and Humbrol, who jokingly, as I said, with a couple other uh, Warlord aficionados, I think Humbrol is the worst paint company in the world, I think. I mean, I think I would actually put uh, Apple Crate craft paint on my models before I'd use Humbrol paints, uh, but that's okay. There's <laughs> always room for improvement, boys. We can work through that. Uh, but yeah, so they've they've got some hobby things. They they also own Corgi, um, which I honestly didn't know was still around. I mean, I knew diecast, diecast models were still around, but um, I didn't realize Corgi was still making a, a large percentage of them in Europe. Um, so they've they've got their hands in a lot of things. And I would wager that Model Railroads is kind of like War Games. It's not a high profit margin kind of endeavor. I mean, everything seems to kind of be a one-off, low production run. And my God, if you're making them out of metal or something like that, then they're going to be even more expensive. Steve, uh, you're the one who's interacted with the model train crowd the most recently. Uh, yeah, you're, you are correct. But uh, the one thing I would say that has me kind of optimistic about this is they own a ton of model train stuff. They own uh, Skelectric slot cars, right? Uh, I don't know. I'm thinking they have a lot of experience with like plastic injection molding and all the air fit. Like I'm feeling like as far as production goes, they probably run a much uh, more refined process than more of a cottage industry than Warlord oh, yeah. does. You know, so oh, I don't yeah. know how much – it sounds to me kind of like Warlord's still going to take care of all their own operation. They're just going to operate under that umbrella. But even if they could get some of that sort of expertise from a company that is like really, really good at it. Uh, and honestly, you know, I, I mean, I joke about the model railroad stuff a lot, but if you look at some of the model train stuff and the slot car stuff, the detail on those things is you know, out of this world. Oh, yeah. so, and, and thanks for bringing up Skeletrix. That was another one that I'd forgotten about because that was actually, it's a, it's another niche market that when you look at it, it's not as popular as it was in the late seventies, early eighties, but it still has people that, that demand it. So I think this is an interesting point because these are all hobbies that have an aging following minus the, the infusion of blood that comes in. Um, because one of the comments about when Hornby went through their last um, collapse, I'll call it, 2019 timeframe, uh, it, it was because they said there wasn't enough, weren't enough people buying uh, model trains. The, the hobby group was aging too much. And so they had you know too many lines, too many products, 
things we hear war game companies say a lot. And I'm sure Airfix says the same thing about models. Um, I'm sure there's stuff that does not appeal anymore uh, to a, a younger group of modelers. So um, they find themselves having to reevaluate and cut that. I think that's good. I think it's going to scare the shit out of most war gamers because now there's a potential, not necessarily in the short term, but in the long term for Warlord's product line to be corporate, more corporate driven. You know, I mean, a, a reality we have to say here is Warlord has been John Stollard's pet game projects for as long as it's been around. Um, and he's invested in what he wants. We've got, as I call, Solard's Folly, the uh, or Big Red Skies, the 172nd scale with Airfix. Uh, terrible sales numbers on those, but a fun thing to play. Um, but just not not the, the the sales that they thought they would get. Um, and then you look at ACW and Pike and Shot. We were talking about uh, Epic Pike and Shot here, and it's just hanging out of the shelves. I, I, you know, unfortunately, it's just not selling, uh, not getting you know, bought the the way that it is overseas. So it's just kind of interesting that, that Epic ACW, hugely successful in the US, probably hugely successful worldwide. Um, and then Pike and Shot, not so much. And maybe it's marketing. Maybe most people don't realize, oh, I'd be playing Revolutionary War with Pike and Shot. They just think about English Civil War or something like that. So I don't know. Um, but I think the the part that, Brett, you alluded to, that's most important is this, two-year transition in two years there's an option for hornby to buy the the rest the 50 the, the 26 percent that takes them to 51 percent and owning an ownership share of the company and what happens at that point and you know smart guys like john stollard will have their plan for their golden parachute um and that's what happens with corporate acquisitions if you don't like it don't be in the corporate world <laughs> i've gone through multiple ones in in my work life, non obviously not podcast life. Hey, if anyone wants to acquire the Leap Suit podcast, I'm happy to sell a 25% share and a 26% option. Um, but but I've gone through it a lot in my work life. So is my wife. I've seen corporate acquisitions there and the good and the bad. Uh, the owners always get taken care of. That's just how it is. That's that's where they're making the money. But also, like you said, it can be a cash infusion for the company, assuming it's put towards corporate operations. Um, which is kind of funny because the company said it was making record amounts of money. Uh, but I guess they always need a cash infusion um, and that, that keeps uh, keeps things running smoothly. So I, th I think in the near term, it's a good thing. Um, I think it's going to be a really interesting to see what happens in two years. And I'll, I'll be the negative Nelly in two years. And so here's my prediction. I'm going to say it now, not because I don't like Warlord, not because I don't like the people there and, and, and wish the mill or anything. Um, but I think. In two years, John Stollard is going to sell his other 26%, giving Hornby a 51%. And then two things that are negative for us specifically in the Blood Red Skies community are going to happen. Um, I'm going to say it now. We're going to lose John Russell. John Russell is redundant at that point. Hornby already has a U.S. division. Hornby doesn't need John Russell. Um, and that's going to be the first damage to us as a, as a community. Um, and second they're going to take a hard look at what lines are profitable. And, you know, we can talk about the impact of, of 3D printing all we want. We can talk about, um, you know, the impact of stuff being in the ready room versus being held tightly as a corporate IP, like master aircraft lists. But I think Blood Red Skies is going to have a hard time making a case for profitability, especially if the line is very large at that point. And remember, Hornby has experience with this. A lot of kind of bespoke items, like a lot of our aircraft are, uh, at a wide line, an aging um, customer base, and not a lot of turnover. So I'm just saying be ready for it if it happens, um, which will kind of dovetail into our next point. But but be ready if Blood Red Skies gets the Skytrex treatment, you know, gets pushed off to the side. Um, I, can it, see, it, it, I can see Bolt Action getting an infusion of, in, you know, if that's the the big money maker, and there's always room for improvement with the sculpts and stuff, and these they're yeah, coming from a place where there's like super attention to detail. Maybe that's that one of the things that I think is best. And and I I'm not a bolt action player, so I really I don't have a dog in the fight. But I think that because it is the leading money maker for Warlord Games, um, Hornby when they have 51 percent is going to go. Okay, boys, where is the money coming in? Let's reinforce success. Let's not reinforce failure. Reinforce success fix sculpts, transition things to plastic. And 
I hate to say this, but go GW on bolt action and make it mainstream, make it um, truly a, a plastic, profitable kind of endeavor because they're going to transition from mom and pop shop to, you know, modern um, production kind of uh, it's that still could be good for brs though because if you think of brs being sort of an allied component to or spinoff if you will of bolt action you know sort of allied game to that perhaps well it it kind of goes down the road we talked about with the missed opportunity the midway set that there may be a point where hornby says okay these in a sense bespoke kits these resin kits let's sky trex them let's shift them to some other part of the production line but let's concentrate on the game with a core of plastic sprues because it's, you know, replicatable, shippable, easy, easy to do in their mindset. Um, and I think that would be good for Blood Red Skies. I, I actually think fewer aircraft, but more consistently done and cheaply done would be good for the game. And then if you want something fancier, if you want something optional, buy it in resin, buy it in what would be Warlord Plus Plus resin at that point. Um, but, is this like uh, the Biden. Forge World model you're talking about here? <laughs> well, it is. And and so here's the problem. Um, we can hate on GW all you want. We can stand here and we can thumb our nose at them. Uh, none of us are in the miniature production business, and they're all making millions at it. <laughs> so we can we can be like those hobbyists who I'm going to talk about in this next segment here and and say all the bad things about how GW is a bunch of dummies and that the, they don't know what they're doing. And who's the one banking the money? It's GW and it's not you, buddy, the one living in your mom's basement. So um, I I think Hornby, also because they've done it with trains. And I know, um, Steve, you've probably gone out and looked at the different train lines. They have some that are super bespoke kits because they're like 295 pounds for the freaking passenger car. Pounds. <laughs> so you convert that to dollars. That's a lot of money for 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 a car. Um, and they have that, but then they have their generic generic family and kids and you know kind of consumer level lines. So they get it. Um, I, th- I think we'll see that transition uh, if and when they take ownership. And I and I'll be honest. I don't know why John Stollard wouldn't sell out. Let's be honest. Any any reason why John should not sell out? Besides, he loves all of us at Lead Pursuit. No, well, wait, maybe he doesn't. I don't know. <laughs> Deathly science, no reasons. Can't even think of one good reason why you shouldn't sell. No, I mean, take, I don't know. Take the money and run. No, I, I guess the reason would be that he just likes what he's doing. Would that be the reason? But I don't know. I mean, you got to really like it a lot, right? Uh, like a lot to keep financially backing it. I mean, yeah. I, don't yeah. Know. I think overall, I, I'm going to go. I, I Doug was kind of a Debbie Downer. I'm going to look at it as a positive. I think it's going to change things. I think uh, they're going to look at making tiny airplanes as almost kind of like a joke in the production aspect of things. Uh, Cause it'll be so simple. It'll be it so, so simple. And I think yeah. they have, you know, uh, as far as a lot of the game systems go, right. The R and D is done. Right. So they yeah. have, they have sculpts, they can make masters of those sculpts, you know, they can fire up air fix or <clears throat> whoever's doing some injection. Mode. I don't know. I think, I think a, for a company that does that type of stuff, Blood Red Skies is a very, very easy game for them to produce. And maybe it'll right. shift it more almost to like a not so much a wargaming type releases, but more towards like a board so gaming board game. style of yeah, releases. Absolutely. I was going to agree with that. that that's, and that's why I think if they neck the line down to a core plastic component, that's where Hornby can really succeed. And Blood Red Skies can help them succeed because it does plug straight into bolt action, their cash cow. Um, and it, it all kind of flows together. You know, at the end of the day, uh, tanks sell better than airplanes. We just know that. That's just how it is. People like tanks. Um, they, they tend to like the World War II stuff more than the Korea stuff. That's just how it is. So I think there's a, a capability for Blood Red Skies to continue. I just think it's, it's going to be fraught with peril and comes down to how the bean counters view it, really. I'll be honest, it's, it's kind of the unfortunate part because you know with guys like John Stollard, Paul Sawyer, you've got hobbyists that are at the core of what's going on. And yes, they listen to the bean counters and we know who the bean counters are. We got to meet them at uh, Adepticon. And Colin, if you're listening to this, you're our favorite bean counter. Keep telling yourself that. Um, but the, the fact is they were always hobbyists first. And so go to Hornby. Maybe not that 
but we'll see. I'm going to, I'm going to try to have a positive attitude, but I'm also going to prep myself for the worst, which is fine. <laughs> we'll just do like we're going to do in this next game. So let's talk about the other bombshell that kind of rolled out, as I call it, the Xeno Sundown. So Games Workshop officially said, hey, we love all you people that are playing Aeronautica, but we're not going to sell the models for all the Xenos races, for all the Eldar, the Tau, um, the Orcs. Those are all going to go away, and some of the Imperials are going to go away, and we're not going to sell them. Uh, we're just going to sell the stuff that plugs into the new Epic, as it's called uh, LI for Legion of Imperialis or something like that. Some crazy Gothic-sounding name. Uh, but we're going to sell, we're going to focus on heresy. Now that created a wave of hate and discontent and crying and i'm surprised we didn't see videos of people melting their models and smashing them with hammers as i think we do every time there's a 40k edition that changes over um but did either of you guys even bat an eye at this notice did, did well, i'm the did only one really? that has xenos in this group so i'm the one that should have <laughs> well, been yeah, crying you're the only guy getting screwed so screw you brett we'll never play with you again now I got some extra Marines in a box. Would you like some? <laughs> and now I have now I have a reason to get uh, Marine models though, because the uh, the the new Epic, for lack of a being able yeah. to pronounce the real name of it. <laughs> exactly. I you know I don't know I'm I'm not that stressed because here's the deal the game wasn't growing, so the game had kind of plateaued with its audience. People stores at least the FLGSs couldn't sell the stuff they had on hand, and. From the beginning, the stores didn't sell of everything. I, you, you all have heard me tell the story that when I wanted to go find extras of stuff, whether it's card decks or um, specific boxes of aircraft, I'd just go overseas. So when I was overseas, I'd walk into a game store, and they definitely hadn't sold out of any of their stuff. Even um, the local DW here. stores here, they were like, yeah, we never sell any of this stuff. We don't know anybody that plays it. Yeah, so I have maybe six people in Huntsville that play it, um, and that's being optimistic uh, on a good day. So the game wasn't going anywhere. So it kind of plateaued. And I think GW looks at it and goes, well, we know we need to tie in with, with uh, 30K kind of stuff, heresy. Let's just hang on to that and push everything else to the side. I, and, and I also say this jokingly, but I'm dead serious. Do you think they fucking took the molds and threw them in the North Sea? No, they, they could turn on production anytime they want. So they may not be making any more to put in a box, to put in the warehouse, to take up space, to cost them money. But they could do that tomorrow. They could go print more if they wanted to. They could turn the game back on. So take it all with a grain of salt. Um, warehouse space is always expensive. From the stories I'm hearing about the drama, especially in the U.S., that GW's having in its warehouse, uh, I, I can see from a corporate level how they're like, let's just cut our losses on the stuff that isn't selling. We know we need to keep some of it because if people are going to get in this game, they're going to have to buy it. But let's cut the stuff we don't need. So I Everyone likes marine models anyway. <laughs> I know. I don't know why everyone just doesn't want to admit it. Just admit that everyone's favorites are marines. Sorry. Everybody really um, wants a Thunderhawk. Yeah, they all want a plastic Thunderhawk. You know you wanted one. You, you had your little vampires. I'm so glad you liked your little vampires. But guess what? You wanted a Thunderhawk. Um, but uh, Steve, any any concern on your end? I mean, I know uh, you have some you haven't built. You, you've been yeah. mooching everyone else's models. I mean, I yeah, you're right. I've been I've been mooching them for this very thing. They're all going to be on eBay tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that's right. Steve loses out too because uh, the uh, the uh, navy stuff is gone. Right? Yeah, some of the yeah, some of the, well, the navy stuff's in. It's the it's the army stuff. So the Vendetta, the Valkyrie, uh, and the I forget the other gunship. Um, those are all gone, but the Navy stuff's still in, so you can still use some of those. It, you know, once again, it's it's a weird amalgamation. I get it. It's the stuff that has to make the fit the fluff and all those kind of things. That's cool. We'll get over it. Just everybody go buy your Thunderhawks. Go to eBay and pay a shit ton of money to the dude who's getting out of, of uh, Aeronautica. Um, but the, the other part of that is most of us have our forces. Keep playing a game. Just just because a company isn't going to sell a game anymore doesn't mean it's the end of the world. I mean, I look over at my war games closet of doom and there's a ton of games over there that are never sold. And yet I still pull them out and we play them. I mean, th there's games that haven't been supported for 20 years or more over there. Um, but do I care? I've got everything I need, you know, uh, I, I think, and I will piss off a lot of 40 K players. When I say this, I think most GW players are spoiled with the level of interaction they get from GW. 
that there are FAQs to rebalance the game, that there is errata put out, that there, as much as people bitch about it, every two years a new codex is coming out. Three years, maybe, if you're the Necrons. Uh, you know, there's always stuff going on. So they think they need that support. Holy shit, dudes, you could go play second edition 40K for all you care, and you don't need any support. Just take your models, put it in there, make your rules if you need to. So I, I think there's there's a lot of a lot of wanking for no good reason. Um, yeah, yeah exactly. Was... <laughs> oh, geez, I got to put my glasses on. Is that Warhammer Fantasy? <laughs> that was my biggest takeaway, too, right? Is like, I like playing it, uh, so I'm going to play it. Like GW yeah. canceled it. They're not coming and confiscating your models, yeah. right? I mean, we're still going to exactly. run events at Adepticon playing it, right? I mean, that's not going anywhere. Uh, yeah, I, I don't I don't really understand what all the craziness is about it, except like Brett said, nobody is buying it. I've gone to our local Warhammer store half a dozen times just to see if I can find somebody to play with. And the guy who owns it is always like, no, nobody plays that game. We don't have anybody playing that game. Nobody plays yeah. that game here. Like, I mean, they're not going to keep making it. Nobody's buying it. Yeah, exactly. So I always tell people when, whenever you complain about what a game company does, you probably ought to look in the mirror as well and realize that part of the reason why they aren't selling it anymore is you didn't bring any more players in. You know, and I said that in a couple of the Aeronautica groups, and I got some butthurt responses, as is expected. But I also got some people who said, hey, you know, I tried. And they go, man, I tried. And people would play it once or twice, and nobody really wanted to keep playing it. They went and did whatever the new hotness was. That's fine. Okay, cool. Cool, man. I've had I've had epic scale miniatures for 20-plus years. I've still got those. Still going to play them. <laughs> Might play them with the new rules. So when AI comes out again in 20 years, I can play with my old plastic if I'm not blind and senile. <laughs> All right. So like like Steve said, we're still doing AI events. We're still going to do uh, things at Adepticon. We're still going to play AI. Um, GW can come pry it from our cold dead fingers because uh, we enjoy it. We have fun. So hopefully you all will too. Hopefully uh, if you guys don't play through it, guys and gals don't play throughout the year, you'll break out your AI models and come visit us and drink some beer and hang out and play games at Adepticon. All right. Well, I think that's enough of the wanking and the bitterness and all that. Let's Let's talk about the 700-pound gorilla, our very own Wing Commander Compendium. Brett, did it warm your heart to get a copy of this in your grubby little paws? It warm, warmed the cockles of my heart. <laughs> <laughs> you just like that word, don't you? Steve, was it good to actually see uh, see a lot of your hard work in there? In I guess it's not really black and white and brown and white or whatever the color yeah, it was. Yeah, it was really cool. I think it turned out, overall, I think it turned out really good i, I think yeah, the community yeah. really showed up and showed out for this one man a lot of good community generated stuff in here yeah so so let's talk about that first kind of what spurred this you know andy has had this vision coming from his time in the 40k world in the in the gw world of you know periodic uh compendiums or 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 you know community guides uh oh uh oh brett wants to cut me off go ahead before i get but, to finish my thought well no i just i got a story to tell i hope i get a chance to tell it about how we started maybe made missteps even but <laughs> we'll get to that in a minute <laughs> we'll talk about our missteps where we fell flat on our face but uh you know andy said let's let's put together something that has a lot of community driven content and that's that's always a minefield because sometimes you get really good community content uh, i think as we did with this Wing Commander. Sometimes you get people scrawling on a piece of paper and calling it a contribution. You know, whatever. Uh, it can be a minefield. But I think Andy uh, has always had the vision of, of adding on things to the system that were not necessarily his. So, you know, there's there's also some peril fraught with that. You're taking other people's stuff and you're putting it in a book and you weren't the author of it, so you may or may not understand it, which is the... Uh, 600 pound gorilla standing next to the 700 pound gorilla in the room. <laughs> There's a few typos in this book. Um, I, I, I am not butthurt about it, except the worst typo is in my scenario. <laughs> so it feels like a personal attack, which I know it's not. So no, Paul Sawyer, I'm not accusing you of a personal attack, but it's just funny that literally my favorite scenario that I wrote for the beyond big alley that Roger and I worked together on is the one that gets messed up and needs the most, uh, most erotic to it, but whatever, if, if you get to a scenario about Sidewinder missiles in the Taiwan Straits, it doesn't make sense. Just go to the Facebook, uh, go to the Ready Room on Facebook and download the correct version there. 
Um, but yeah, there's there's some typos, there's some omissions, there's things that got changed, uh, things that got dropped out. Like in the master list, there's a couple columns that got uh, disposed of, which uh, don't make it easy to tell if something was a naval aircraft or a land-based aircraft. But overall, I think it's a, I think it's a pretty darn good product. Um, you know, I mean, it it is built around the core of what Brett was going to talk about of air medals and iron crosses. Brett, you're probably going to share something there. Uh, well, I, we've probably talked about it a little bit in a previous episode, but you know, really, it just came from Steve and I playing games online remotely during COVID, and then we said, "Hey, it'd be fun to be able to link these games together." Next thing you know, we're kind of crafting our own campaign, for lack of a better term. And uh, you told me at our very first gathering of eagles, which was remote. You know, I, I think I did a, I don't know, like a session on Discord where I explained to people what Steve and I were doing. And at that point, it was literally just pieces of notebook paper stapled together with marginal notes and all kinds of photocopies <laughs> from other sources all put together, right? Fix this and here. <laughs> he's like, he's like, uh, Doug says, you should, you should like write that up so we can share it with the community. And I was like, oh, really? Anyway, <laughs> on a three hour drive home, I said, yeah, I could do that. So anyway, 15 months later, yeah, and, yeah, and it was literally like a full time job because I was I was stuck at home. I couldn't couldn't go to my work. So almost eight hours a day for most of that fifteen months, Steve and I were putting that stuff together. And uh, anyway, I think my so my perspective obviously is kind of focused on the air medals and iron crosses because that's what we spent a lot of time working on, and it is a considerable portion of the Wing Commander uh, the compendium. But I'm. Um, pretty excited i didn't know to what degree it would be modified from the original thing that we produced and you know besides like some negligible little transpositional typos and cut and paste errors you know from the original uh they did a fantastic job and man it's really true to the original we'll get it more into the details and stuff but i just overall impressed at how much they they kept all the original content that we made and what little bit of clunkiness might exist in there, it's purely because they took a lot of stuff we gave them and had to cram it into a new format. And, you know, right. they weren't, <laughs> in some cases, I guess they weren't able to simply copy the, the format we gave them. And somebody had to type some stuff in. And, of course, that I, I, leads to Humans are involved. There will whatever. Be, yeah, there, there will be typos. Um, but I, I think overall they did, they did a good job with it. It's always good to have the art in there. It's good to have – um, production values that may be different than your home production value. Although while they have a nice cover, I still liked our cover <clears throat> better. Peter Robichaud, thank you once again for the use of your cover for our short eight production run. <laughs> yeah. Should I tell the story about what we kind of, what we presented to Andy and how that was... we'll get back to that. Okay. I, I, uh, I, I want to go through a little bit what's in here um, because some people have heard us talk about this whole thing and have, have heard us wax philosophical about uh Air medals and iron crosses, but I want to give credit where credit's due to all the other contributors that that are in this book because it isn't just you guys, it isn't just your product. Yes, that is a large chunk of it, um, but there's a lot of other people whose whose good work is in here. So let's roll right from the beginning um, and talk through what's in there. So the first thing is the uh, the blood red skies tactical tips for beginners from Dan Dion, and you know that one I think Dan put that out about a year, maybe a year and a half ago. Um, in the ready room, always a good bit of information. Uh, Dan and I may argue tactics and we may uh, argue about what the best combinations and the best way to do things are. Um, but it's a very good baseline for how to think tactically. I won't say it's not, it's not necessarily the tactic you always want to use. And I think Dan would say the same thing, that it's not a, it's not a how-to book. But it's it's a how to think kind of thing, and, and it literally um, gives you a series of tips, things to consider. But you know, even in here, he he kind of tends to to explain that tactics is an art. It's it's not just a checklist, um, and that that you have to take some raw numbers and take a look at those odds. You got to take some some known maneuvers and and things like burning advantage and maintaining wingman effect when you do that. Uh, and kind of put them all together. But the good thing, ironically enough, as as he goes through all of this and gives a couple caveats, a couple things that you should remember that you can do, um, is that 
there are a few themes that he does a good job hammering home. I think it's it's really two things. It's knowing your airplane, so knowing the odds or knowing the odds that that your opponent is going to generate against you, and always using your wingman. Uh, two things that we've kind of always told people at the basis of everything tactical we talk about. Make sure you're, you're maintaining your wingman effect or using your wingman effectively, and they're not just there as an extra shooting attack. Um, and then understand what those odds are. So when you either hang it out and know you're going to get shot at, what are the odds you're going to lose an advantage level? Uh, what are the odds that the enemy's going to hit you and give you a boom shit? So I think, I think that was a uh, was a was a good addition uh, to start off with. Brett, Steve, any uh, any add-ons about that? Yeah, I, I would say, yeah, I, I think it's really good, and I think obviously. My, I was kind of heads down focus mode on what me and Brett did, but all the things you're going to talk about <laughs> coming through this are, are really, really good. And like you said, all the contributors really do uh, deserve a shout out here, but yeah, it's a really good basics of some of the stuff that we always say about blood red skies. It's really easy to learn, but there's a lot of depth to it. And I think yeah. this beginner's, yeah the things that are laid out is almost kind of like uh, a cheat sheet to your first couple of games. So you play right. your first game and then, Oh, try this, try this, try this. And I think that stuff is kind of laid in there where you're kind of learning some of those lessons that some of the other beginners learned for you. So you don't have to take the time to learn those. Two <laughs> don't I think it's really good. these things. Yeah. No, and, and the good thing is, you know, right at the end, uh, you know, Dan wraps it up with with always a good pitch for Blood Red Skies is sportsmanship. Blood Red Skies is not an exact game. You might move 43.2 degrees or you might need to move 48 degrees. Uh, you know, there, there's the, the tools that you use aren't precise. So have fun, play the game, be a good sport about it and don't get too wrapped around the axle about the results because it's just a game. Um, and as he says, you know, hey, if you can't agree on a rule, just go ask someone in the ready room. Don't worry, you'll only get 17 different opinions for one simple question <laughs> but no it's a good uh, a good thing there all right i, I want to take the time some, to oh, go ahead to, yeah. i want to read through this the next time i play a game almost as an after action review like read read through his um yeah his suggestions and see to what degree did i follow those you know if i could improve on any of those after my last game while it's still fresh in my head yep yeah absolutely and i think you will find there are more questions than answers in what Dan writes. And, and he, he really forces you to think here's a technique, but assess whether you need it or not. So I think that's good. Uh, there is the infamous solo enemy flow chart that uh, I look back. Some, some things age well, some things don't age well. I look back and I go, man, there's some ways I could really improve that. Um, but it's once again, the difference of having another probably two years of playing uh, since we put that out right at the beginning of COVID and everyone said, Hey, I'd like to play this game by myself. And Andy had some some detailed thoughts he'd laid out. Uh, my stupid analytical brain had to put that into a flowchart. Uh, so that's in there. I take no credit for uh, uh, any of that. Uh, Andy probably cleaned it up and made it look good. All right. Uh, the third piece in there, um, I'm not sure if this refers to uh, a bunch of rangers getting cleaned up or if it's part of a game, but flat tops in a bathtub. Um, a little disturbing the imagery that it just it gives me right there, but Ken Nat's uh, campaign, mini campaign system in there uh, for chasing carriers, creating kind of a narrative around finding the carriers, attacking the carriers. Um, I like that because it's, it's pretty much a direct port from those campaigns uh, with some nicer art thrown in there. Um, but I, I, I think like a couple of the things you'll see in here, this is, these were the attempts to say, we like Blood Red Skies and we'd like to play it with a little bit of a story or a little bit of a challenge between it um, because just showing up, pushing people's airplanes around uh, gets a little boring. But when you're out there in a sense, playing battleship, looking for, uh, looking for the other side's carriers, uh, it's a, it's a pretty cool game. All right. Next thing, Blood Red Skies Scenario Toolkit, also by Dan Dion. Damn it, Dan, you've already got two things in here to my one. Uh, I actually have not dug through this a whole lot. I'll be honest. That's one of the things I was like, man, I got to read that in detail and get back to it. Um, I know what Dan was trying to do. He, he's given us basically a, a very easy way to, um, uh, to create a narrative scenario that doesn't necessarily fall right into one of the, the, the basic airstrike style scenarios. Um, but then 
how to build those scenario special rules and those kind of things that that you might want to do when you're making your one-off scenario or making a historical scenario based upon this event and we're going to steal a bunch from airstrike but we want to pull some uh some special rules in that give it more of a narrative flair and then there's some cool ones like dan and i've talked about like the, the bomber removes last um special rule where you you don't activate by pilot skill you always make the bombers be the last guy so even your worst fighter pilot moves before your best bomber um obviously a change from the main rules but it, it forces them back into being kind of the subject of all the uh all the fighter attack missions uh and then a lot of other cool little things in there like light flak uh and indeterminate advantage so all right there's also another scenario by dan uh which we've all played if you've been at gathering of eagles uh, and then we get to Beyond Megali. I'm only going to say this very briefly. Beyond Megali, lots of fun, post-Korea, uh, and the rules are not the final answer. We wrote it uh, between uh, Roger Garish and I to to be a way of looking at how to simulate uh, jets and short-range air-to-air missiles and all these kind of things that pushed against the boundaries of Blood Red Skies. We've talked about it a million times in the podcast. I don't want to uh, dwell too long other than saying I am hurt horribly and will cry in my pillow tonight um, that there are proofreading errors in the Sidewinder Strikes on page 22, uh, that those are all wrong and you should cut and paste the original scenario in there instead. But uh, they did a really good job taking some ugly scenarios from Roger and I and turning them into pretty uh, scenarios with some art in there and explaining how to set them up. There's some quick start ones. So if you don't want to do any of these fancy deployment things, there's some quick start ones about Korea. Then there's some post-Korea for uh, Indo-Pakistan and for Taiwan Straits. Anything you want to say about these besides how what a wonderful set of rules Roger and I wrote for Jan McGalley? No, you don't want to say that. Never mind. <laughs> uh, I, I really like these missile rules. I think, again, if you're talking about what blood red skies is where it's an abstraction of air combat. I think these are these the most simulation style, accurate missile rules you're ever going to find in a game. No, are these missile rules that fit the flavor and style of blood red skies? I think it, it really meshes those together just about as well as you could. So if you're get into jets and into that like early missile stuff. I think you really, really ought to look at it. I think you'll like it. Yeah. For those who don't know, I'll, I'll <clears throat> throw this out here as a reason to buy the book. Uh, should you be bored with the jets that are in blood of Red skies? Oh yes. In this one, you get the MiG 21, the uh, Lockheed F-104, the uh, Dassault Mystere, Hawker Hunters. Yeah. So all that, you know, late fifties, early sixties kind of jet stuff you'll love. Yeah. Stats for those are in there. So buy the book just for the stats. Yeah, like that's going to happen. <laughs> All right, moving on. Uh, Mike Bersix, uh historical pilot ratings. I like that because once again, it kind of breaks down and gives you another tool in the toolkit for making a historical scenario that makes sense. So you're not just willy nilly spending points. You're taking a look at you know what year it is, and it's and it's built around you know a squadron of twelve pilots, but it gives you a chance to to really give a historical flair to the the quality of the pilots that you're selecting. And it goes through the major belligerents, um, gives you some comments about some of the other minor powers uh, and how to uh, and how to do theirs. But I think it's a it's a cool thing uh, as an addition there. And then we get to the 700 pound gorilla. Holy cow. Could you guys put any more pages in this? This is smaller than the first version that I ripped in half. So I guess we, we are making progress. <laughs> so on this like version 17, Wing Commander, the, it's got. Air medals and iron crosses as a campaign system. Um, we have beat that to death over at least four episodes that I can think of. Um, in hindsight, now that we're at the at the production point where this hits the public and people are already finding typos and questions about how to interpret the rules, Brett, what are your initial thoughts, concerns? You know, wh where do you see this going in the next few months? Oh, I'm super happy that that it's out there and people can you know, mess around with it and enjoy it. That was really our intent was to put something together that people can enjoy the same way Steve and I were. And, uh, man, I was kind of really impressed how they really virtually a hundred percent used everything that we put in. 
Uh, the only, you know, there's the only real functional change that I see is that in our original rendering, we envisioned that you would be creating two separate squadrons, a fighter squadron right. and a separate attack squadron so that, you know, you had a balance of forces to use regardless of whatever um, mission you ran, you know? So if you have some ground attack uh, component to your mission, you've got those assets because your fighters will always go in, right? But then you could still have a separate squadron of attack guys to play around with. And in this version, uh, it, that's been modified for simplicity, I think maybe for brevity, to be a single 24 pilot squadron that are mixed between, at your choice, some number of fighters and attack. And I think in some of the cut and paste, if you were reading word for word through the stuff, you might see some leftovers of, you know, where some of the wording says, you know, your squadrons <laughs> that might exactly. like, cause some confusion. That's probably where that comes from. And But anyway, beyond that, I mean, it was really... I'm really impressed with the fact that they stayed so true virtually verbatim to everything that went in. You know, I mentioned early on that, you know, as I was reading it word for word, I saw some things that jumped out at me. It's just clearly just like little transpositional typos, some cut and paste stuff that, you know, didn't exist in the original document that we provided, but the burden of being able to take 110 pages of content that we gave them and, <laughs> put it in this book. I mean, that's just bound exactly. to happen. I, I know what that challenge is like because we probably went through eight versions of our set on, on our own in 15 months to get to what we provided them. Yep. So yep. they certainly didn't take 15. In the, fi in the final cover. You know, absolutely. Absolutely. Version. Yep. So, well, so I, I will say this, you know, we, we do nitpick on, on the proofreading. That's the toughest thing. And traditionally that is the weakest part of most game development, designing uh, anything like that is the proofreading. Um, but I think they did a good job taking uh, what what you gave to Andy and then Andy taking putting his spin on it. Um, and, and I actually think, you know, stepping back from it, I I think I like the fact that it's now a a wider choice of aircraft. You're not stuck with two squadrons in that sense you really can kind of piecemeal some things and take some multi-engines and some single engines and and you can you can build out uh a more task organized force that you can do some cool things with now once again the more task organized you are obviously the more specific it becomes to that campaign and if you find yourself with only torpedo bombers left <laughs> then you're screwed but i think it i think it does allow you to to tailor your campaign force a little bit better in in ways that you couldn't when you just had two. No, two I, I disagree because you still had you still had the, it really the only functional difference is you have twenty four pilots instead of twenty six pilots instead of two thirteen. That's really, 13, 13, that's really yeah. it. That's really it because in both instances, right? You get to have whatever mix of fighter and attack aircraft you want. So an example of that would be. Like in my current duty rosters for the campaign we're playing, I have a mix of BF 109 Fs, uh, BF 109 Es uh, in my fighter squadron, and then in my attack squadron, I had uh, BF 110s and JU 88s now, and varying numbers, you know. So, it, it virtually right. any mission, I could have, you know, as many as four different squadron cards right I, uh, you would do the I same thing I, in a, I was, in a 24 i was thinking big picture that th how it's the game muddles um like like the heavy uh, i should almost said heavy fighters but that's that's yet another component of this but how you get certain attack aircraft like the typhoon and the tempest that are also excellent fighters that when you pair that up in some ways those guys with strafing ordnance or with bomb shackles almost become more effective than a single fighter and a single um, oh yeah, uh, well yeah, because a, a, a know, single attack aircraft, you know. Sometimes kind of I use my one tens specifically for fighting bombers, and that's really, right. And you might say, "Well, that's a fighter role," but they just work good for that, so I'll use yeah. it for that. You know, yeah, that <laughs> exactly. Happens. So that's that's what I meant by the task organizing. You can you can pick some of those crossover aircraft, and you can go, you know what? I I'm going to take aircraft that the day of the game I can decide what they do. Unlike that's if right. I took a Dauntless or a torpedo bomber, or you know, if I took a, any one of those things that I'm kind of kind of pigeonholed but even yeah it's a very honest, minor difference yeah, yeah it's a, it's a, minor difference. a lot of a lot of the aircraft with all the cards that are out there you can add bomb shackles or torpedo shackles so 
I could take a bomber and throw torpedo shackles on him, and now I got a torpedo bomber. So I'm not, I'm not super constrained, but I guess if you wanted to be aircraft pure, you know, it gives you some, a few more options. But I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know if you know it would be radically changed from the original content. It really wasn't. So that was yeah, pretty pretty exciting for me to see that. Steve, I, I see you over there crying because you know it's, it's so different than what you wrote. <laughs> no, I'm yeah, I. The one thing I want to tell people, just from some of the stuff that's come up on the ready room, is I don't think Brett or myself ever intended this to be like sit down and read through thirty pages and then play it. Right? This right, is kind of right. like uh, it's more like a choose your own adventure book where you like read a couple pages, do a couple steps, read a couple pages, do a couple steps, and if anything seems like it's confusing or it doesn't fit, the number one thing I would say is play your game, go to the flow chart, like do (laughs) step one, you know, complete step one, do step two, play the game. And then where the flow chart fits in, if you just follow through the flow chart, that is going to pretty much be your one-stop shop to answer all the questions. Uh, Yeah. Choose your adventure analogy is really excellent. Because if you were reading the whole thing, it'd be like reading every page in a choose your own adventure book. Like this story doesn't make any sense. Well, and and yeah. that was one of the first, uh, you know, parting of the ways that we had was I'm like, my God, you guys repeat yourselves 10,000 times in here. But it's because you designed it that way that you would get to that step and it would say the exact same steps you went through. And my analytical mind was like, no, I must, must make this efficient. I must say, go to page 46 and do these same steps again. Um, but you guys had written it as, no, you're going to step through. You're now at the end of the day and you're doing these steps and some of them are very similar to the beginning of the day. Um, so I, I, I think there's, there's an understanding that has to be had about, um, the, the best way to go through and it may not be cover to cover, uh, on air. air yeah. Air. I was answering yeah, some questions on Facebook today. Somebody was kind of curious. He was like, Hey, what about this thing to step here? I'm like, yeah, just play, man. Just play. Because like all those, all those steps or what looks like steps on, uh, I'm making up numbers, page 51, those aren't going to be a step in your game because you're going to skip right over that to go to a specific page because that's what you rolled, right? All those other things are just in case you rolled a three instead of a six or whatever, right? So it's it's hard to so explain I, that I until you actually just get started, you know? Yeah, you're, you're going one through, through one of those interesting things that, that any game designer, developer, whatever goes through that the, the categories of questions fall into one of two types of people. There are the, I read the rules and overthought everything, and I don't understand it, but I haven't played it even yet, and I'm going to ask all the questions. Or there's the, I didn't read any of the rules and just tried to wing my way through it. And and both of them are thoroughly infuriating because you want to tell them exact opposite things. You want to tell the first player, just play it, dude. Have fun. The second one, you're like, hey, man, you might want to read through the whole set <laughs> before you try to do that. So it seems contradictory guidance, um, but I think what you guys have there is a, is a solid product. Yeah, I would also say the other thing to add to this, too, is like you don't have to. This will work if you only like parts of it. Right. Yes. So like if yes. you don't That's... want to do all the stuff with the player characters and the wing commas are right. grounding your favorite pilot and blah, and you don't want to do that, then just don't do that. And this will still work. If you only want to do uh, the damaged aircraft checks for your guys that got shot down, if you only there's a section in it about the random event, if you only want to use the random event table just to add some kind of like flair to a one off game and you don't even want to do the campaign, those random events, you could use them in a scenario game and it'll work. So it's not. You know, you don't have to do it as we designed it. I think it gives you the tools to do a really thorough campaign. And I think there's stuff in there for uh, if you like any different aspect of it that you can use it however you want and and find something fun in it. Yeah, we tried really hard to make it super flexible. And one of the components of that flexibility that was really important to me is we played, I don't know how many games now, but uh, we, we suggest that maybe one game equals one month, right? But make it whatever you want. In some ways, it'll be a lot more satisfying for you if every single game you play equals one week of real time, you know, depending right. on the campaign. But maybe every, you know, and I think there's some narrative that suggests all this I'm saying, but, you know, maybe one game is one day. And, you know, if it's a short battle that you're playing, uh, and it, it'll have different things will happen in your campaign. For Steve and I, we intend to play for a very long time. So doing one game equals one month means that over the time that we get to play, we'll get to see new aircraft kind of come to available, right? right? Well, that's, but that's but what I the, wanted to anchor on because that helps you choose yeah. how much time you devote 
to each, each yeah, day. Yeah, that, that, that choice comes at a cost, though, because now, because one game equals one month, we see it takes forever for a guy to reach A status because you just don't right. get a lot of kills in a single game. Like You, know, you might get some kills in a game, but that, that single pilot is not going to rack up necessarily a whole bunch of kills. You know, if it was one every week, one game equals a week, maybe that would happen more frequently. But at the cost of now, we don't get to see – you know, new aircraft maybe come in as frequently. So you just kind of got to balance that, like what you want to do with the game. Uh, well, but anyway, so all of it was designed to be to accommodate what you want to do. Yeah. And this is an important point, no matter what the game you're playing is. I mean, it, it comes down to a lot of times, especially in a campaign style or in a solo game, anything that's not just a, I play it once and I put it away. You're telling a story, you're building a narrative. And so if the narrative you want is about those individual pilots and battle fatigue and pilots becoming aces and other dudes getting shot down if they've only been there a week, if, if that's the narrative you craft, then shorten the time frame. But realize you're going you're gonna to be burned out in 30 days in a month of actual flying. You know, you're going you're gonna to kind of tell that story and come to the culminating point. Or if you're going to make it about the progression of a squadron through the war – and changing aircraft, changing theaters, changing you know tactics and considerations, and having to swap out some of these things, then that's when you choose a, a larger period of time, and you realize that you're going to lose some of the granularity. And it's just but once again, it's the story that you and whoever else is playing in this campaign want to tell. So choose it, choose it wisely. And if you don't like it, then suddenly change the the uh, time scale time scale of your uh, <laughs> of your campaign halfway through. Well, I can tell you that this certainly this endeavor wouldn't have been possible at all without the help of uh, uh, Leslie Mitchell. Uh, for one, Leslie, we owe him a lot. Um, all those he, all those pilot a, charts, I mean, those uh, yeah. aircraft charts that are in there. You know, that was a real important component of the game, just to be able to pick the kind of aircraft you want. And that's and to be right about it, because let's not act like this is something that that grognards the world over agree on. You put this chart out and people are going to argue about it. Now, Leslie has done the research because that's the kind of operations analyst he is. That's why we love you, Leslie. But but there are going to be people who are going to argue about the aircraft availability charts. Okay, whatever. Change it yourself. Don't care. Make it whatever you want. Um, this was y'all's best hack with Leslie as to when aircraft were historically available in the numbers required to field a squadron. So I, I think it's a lot, a lot of cool research went into that. Yeah, and, and that's an important part of the gameplay too, because it really it gets you to play some aircraft that you wouldn't normally play, right? So like you kind of, right. you, you kind of, even there were times where I was playing Brett, where the aircraft I wanted to play was in short supply, and I was kind of like, man, I really want to field, you know, five of these, but I, so, but I couldn't, and I had to make some kind of compensation for another one, but. I mean, it's a really important part of the way the the way the campaign plays. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's it's a really well done part of it by Leslie. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, what else do you want to say besides it's the best part of the book? It's the finest ever. It took years of work and was <clears throat> crafted by two geniuses. What <laughs> what else do you want to say about it? Couldn't have said it better else? myself. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I want to play more right. games. I, well, yeah, you guys need to get I back know. on tabletop sim and keep playing. No. All right. Well, let's let's cover the last two things that are in there. Uh, yes, the Ready Room Aircraft list is in there, but what I'll tell you is it's probably slightly more confusing and less authoritative than the one on the Ready Room. So should there be any questions, go off the Master Aircraft list with a date stamped on it. So um, for tournaments, we're not going to use the Wing Commander Master Aircraft list. Consider that a advisory guide for your games. We're still going to go off of the Blood Red Skies Ready Room master aircraft list because that will continue to evolve now would we like to see that list be in a product every year similar to this sure we also know warlord is not going to release a tournament packet every year um, but that's that's where we'd love to be and then obviously there's the faqs and errata which is going to get longer because next year's errata is going to have all the wing commander stuff in it too soon no not not too soon um but the FAQ and errata is a key component of that as well. There's because there's been a few people that have missed kind of the the history of some of the fixes in Blood Red Skies, and now they start playing. They start asking questions. We're like, no, that was three years ago. We answered that question. So um, take a good look at that, uh, which really all leads me back to the big question: you know, why should I buy this? A lot of this stuff's out on the internet somewhere. Why buy it? 
Well, because it's all in one place and it looks pretty and you'll actually read it. And it's easier to bring to a convention than a big stack of printed out papers or something on your iPad. So um, I think it's worthwhile getting. I mean, it's full disclosure. Yes, Brett and Steve and I all got ours free. Thank you, Andy. We owe you. I have my Andy autographed copy. Um, so, uh, but I, I would have gone out and bought a copy had I not been sent one. So, um, I think it's I think it's definitely worth investing in. What do you guys think? Buy it before Hornby destroys it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Buy it before they take the entire stock and throw it in the North Sea because we're getting rid of Wing Commander. Uh, okay, so uh, realistically, um, there's going to be some errata to it. Not a big deal. Go out, buy it, love it, uh, dig into it. And more importantly, uh, try the campaign system and tell Brett and Steve how terrible their campaign system is. Yeah, because we've been waiting up. for years. Hit me up on Facebook if you have questions. Uh, uh, they call know. it the socials now. That hit you up on the, the socials? socials. Oh, all right. Well, whatever. you're a boomer, so you're only going to be yeah, on, yeah. on Facebook now. <laughs> well, yeah. If you have questions, I, I really encourage you. It, I want to hear. I want to hear what people think about it. You know, I want to hear about games people have played. Of course, if you have questions, if something, something doesn't make, does not make sense, I could, I could probably help. Yeah, I feel like we could work like an exchange program too. If anybody's just starting out, maybe I could like (laughs) ship some of my pilots over, give you a little boost, right? That's right. I mean, I know Brett. Slightly used pilots. Yeah, was you know give you some stats. I know Brett's got a guy named Rudy Viner. Who is he still alive, or did he get shot down finally? I don't know. Uh, I I think he might be captured. I I can't recall. Something bad (laughs) happened to him. I, I think he's still alive though. I thought he had a run in with a local bombshell and was at the uh, yeah. medical facility getting penicillin <laughs> shots. <laughs> Sadly, we never got the, the local bombshell. Either one of us got the <laughs> local bombshell in all the games we played. Yes. <laughs> you had perfectly PG games. Oh, well, that's good. The the thing that, uh, you know, I'll say about all this is please reach out to us, you know, on, on, social media on Facebook, uh, Instagram, uh, send us a, a comments uh, piece. You know, just, just make sure you ask the questions because Brett and Steve are both in the ready room. I'm in there uh, every once in a while, usually to make snarky comments or drop Blackadder memes, uh, as Ken fell right into that trap again today. Uh, but the, the point is reach out to us. We'll help you with what you don't understand about it um, and walk you through some of the, the best ways to play it and some of the cool things to do with campaigns. Rudy Viner is a POW. I looked him oh. up. <laughs> <laughs> hey, at least you guys are fighting Western Front. Is he stuff, a POW so, you know, for good or does he still have a chance to escape or is that ship sailed? No, man. Every every mission roll a six. If you roll a if you roll a <laughs> unmodified six, he's uh he returns a friendly I've had I've had one guy return. Yeah, you that did. That was captured. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Uh, all right. Well, anything that they, anyone's looking forward to in the next week besides Steve and I actually flying to Oklahoma City, getting there in one piece and picking up the rental car and not being stuck in a small economy vehicle together. Yeah, I was just going to say, <laughs> or, if you don't follow Lead weekend. Pursuit on Twitch yet, right? Get on Twitch. We're going to be streaming the tournament oh, yeah, again. Good point. Follow us on Twitch. We're going to be out there live. Promo that. Yeah. Yep. We'll be out there. We'll be talking about some things, doing some interviews, doing some streaming uh, with our not so ghetto streaming gear this time. So thanks, Steve, for all the effort yeah. you put in. Can you, uh, you know, I, I saw some of the improvements you made on that. You want to mention what you've yeah, done? Give us, give us kind of a rundown there, Steve. Uh, I don't know. I think we just improved some of the visuals, improved some of the equipment that we're actually taking. So it doesn't look, you know, cut down on the number of zip ties by about a thousand. So it's just a, yeah, we went, yeah, exactly. <laughs> went from 800 to eight. So I'm, I'm pretty happy about Much that. Much more polished look. I thought we were going to break the bank having to buy bags of, uh, <laughs> of zip ties. <laughs> now I think the whole thing is going to look a lot better, uh, improve some of the cameras. So if you watch the first time and you liked it, that was kind of like our proof of concept at Adepticon. I think this could be basically considered like version 1.0. And I think if you have some time on, I guess Saturday, right? Saturday. Saturday and we can do some on Sunday as well. Yeah, cool. definitely cool. Uh, hop on our Twitch, watch the feed and uh, maybe even send in some questions, right? Doug will be answering live questions, all kinds Please of Please send in questions. On. I'll, I'll answer, I'll, I'll happily answer live questions during the, uh, uh, during the tournament uh, as we're laughing at everybody flailing around there and making sarcastic comments, but no, are it's, you going to have a guest shoutcaster with you on the, uh, 
on the two monitors like we did. Like it was you and me, and then Andy showed up. So yeah, I'm not going. I don't think I'm going to get that. I'm not going to get that fortunate, and I'm going to have to be doing it by myself. So um, I'm going to kind of, if I can shame uh, Casey into uh, being one of the talking heads, someone else. I might even shame John into being a talking head for a little bit. That'd be scary. So we'll uh, we'll definitely definitely go ahead and uh, get all that set up. A little real time tactics talk. My... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> real time John Russell tactics. Fly bigger airplanes. One seventy second scale. It's the only way to go. All right. Well, with that, I just want to thank everybody for listening to the podcast. Please go out there and follow us, like, subscribe, uh, leave us some comments. Because once again, if you don't leave us comments and if you don't subscribe, then all this whole algorithm driven world doesn't forward our podcast to anyone else. So then you're only hanging out listening to the podcast with all the other Blood Red Skies players, all six of them. So <laughs> all six of them and Steve's mom who also listens. So seven, we have seven followers now. Uh, but anyway, in all seriousness, please let us know what you want to talk about. We've got a couple uh, tactics and aircraft focus uh, episodes coming up as well. as Some other games we're going to talk about because Steve, we still have not talked about missile threat. So after Historicon, baby, we'll do it. Oh yeah, definitely. Missile threat all day. <laughs> all right. Thanks everyone. Keep climbing for advantage. Gotta Y'all have saying. a great weekend and keep climbing for advantage. That's how you should say it. You don't sell it enough. You gotta really go. Okay, for I need it. To, I need I need to believe it, so I need to sell it. I need you to gotta go. really go for it. Thanks for listening to us tonight and keep climbing for advantage. That's I feel like it. I should have like like the, the yeah. shaded glasses on. Yeah. And that's it. Like the yeah. promo, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. God. What else can I mean? What else do you say? The uh, hey, you're. May your drinks be cold and your nights hot. And I'm John Russell, coming from view from my own basement. <laughs> Does he say that at the end of his? May your resin spears be pointy and your airplanes fly well. I don't know. 